and talk a little bit about, oops, <clears throat> talk a little bit about blood vessels and circulation. We're moving into chapter 20. And again, when, when we look at um, going back to the back, I was gonna say back to the future, that doesn't make sense, going back to the back, back to the past last week, um, chapter 18 on blood, on blood generally you, you're gonna wanna go through most, if not all of that chapter in open stacks. Now, chapter 19, we really only did 19.1. So don't feel like, and, and this is all in Blackboard under the units too. It breaks down which open stacks to, to look at. But anyway, chapter 20, uh, similar deal uh, as chapter 19. We're really only going to focus on the first uh, uh section and that's really it so 20.1 is going to be our focus the bulk of, of chapter 20 and the bulk of chapter 19 is physiological principles it gets into blood pressure and um all kinds of of how blood viscosity and so anyway we'll get into that next semester so chapter 20 just focusing really on the first section that section's going to discuss some of the basics of blood. And then I believe it's uh, section maybe five uh, also gets into some of the specifics of blood vessels. So um, anything physiology, you don't need to worry about. Um, so, and then chapter 21 is lymphatic and immune. Kind of the same thing. There's only a couple sections in there that we, we want to focus on. We do spend some time doing immunity uh, next semester. We'll get into antibodies and, and, and innate immunity and adaptive immunity and how immunity works. Uh, but, but for now, we're just going to tell you that uh, you've got some glands, you've got some lymph nodes, you've got you know, you've got some fluid and some vessels. So, uh, so we'll keep it relatively uh, short and sweet. Uh, blood vessels, we've seen this before, uh, we, not this image, but we've seen the word blood and the word vessels uh, before. Uh, the vascular part of cardiovascular does, ha does mean vessels. So uh, last uh, Tuesday and, and Thursday, definitely, we got into the heart and some of the basics of flow of heart or flow of blood through the heart. So um, as you look at the new padlets that are up for unit eight, both of them are there, unit 8A, unit 8B. Um, so you'll, there's one on flow of blood uh, through the heart, the pathway of circulation. Uh, so if you know that the basic pathways, you're also seeing and visualizing uh, the structures that are involved. Now, we discussed veins briefly. We discussed arteries briefly. We also discussed capillaries briefly. So we're going to go a little bit further with those three structures uh, or three vessels. Um, so this picture, I mean, yeah, this guy's showing off his, his forearms, his guns. Uh, this isn't a selfie, by the way. Uh, so anyway, vein, that's, veins generally are closer to the surface, by the way. So when we look at, at an image, like this, uh, and, and what you'll be doing with a vein is probably taking blood out of it. So uh, you may be uh, in doing some intravenous uh, injections or, or putting an IV in as well. So um, we can put things into veins, we can pull things out of veins. Generally, we want to avoid poking arteries. Uh, we don't want to penetrate an artery. The pressure inside of an artery is a lot higher uh, than in veins. And so if we do puncture an artery, you're going to get quite a bit of, of bleeding. It's going to be spurting, uh, likely. Whereas a vein, the blood's going to be uh, less pressure behind it. So it's not going to spurt all over the place. So uh, we generally, we, we always draw blood from a vein and we can see it's called the median cubital vein. You can kind of see it uh, right in this area here. So anyway, we do uh, see veins, arteries are a little more protected. They're not uh, as close to the surface. Uh, we use uh, uh, pulse checks and, and those, that's going to be artery. So when you, if you palpate for pulse, uh, um, nowadays they just 
you you know you don't have to have the, the watch out or look up at the second hand and, and count and now it's a everything's advanced so we put a little pulse oximeter we can measure a couple of things at once so we can get heart rate we can get uh, oxygen uh, levels and so anyway arteries uh, blood pressure too we generally are thinking about arteries so uh, so anyway that's what's going on there this uh little illustration is similar to one we saw last week. We looked at circulation and, and analyzed the what we call the pulmonary circuit, which dealt with sending blood from the right side of the heart over to the lungs to drop off CO2 and pick up oxygen, bring that blood back to the left side of the heart, and then pump that blood out to the body systems. So then we call that the systemic circuit. So we have two separate circuits going on. We've got a pulmonary circuit and a systemic circuit. And again, the, the whole the name of the game is getting carbon dioxide out, getting oxygen in. So that's uh, really what what the what the goal is. And our different blood vessels are responsible for not only delivering uh, oxygen, but also uh, taking away carbon dioxide. And, and again, the color codes that we use, red is implies that we're dealing with blood that's uh, oxygenated and blue vessels implies that we're dealing with blood low in oxygen. Now, uh, we, we've got a couple, of, I'm gonna move on pretty soon, relatively quickly from this slide, uh, because some of the information uh, we've seen before, some of it is maybe getting the cart before the horse. So uh, I do just wanna, or did just wanna uh, reintroduce you to it, get you caught back up uh, and segue from what we ended with really last Thursday and what we're doing today. So we could see all of this nice red blood traveling uh, and breaking up into different uh, sections. So we will see uh, a variety of arteries uh, that are going to have branches and uh, off of the main artery, the aorta. So as we leave the left side of the heart and, and bring blood uh, out to the body systems, that main uh, uh, kind of uh, conductor, I guess, of blood flow uh, is going to be the aorta. So uh, off of the aorta, we're going to see several different branches, even right away up at that aortic arch. Okay, so that's what they're showing here. And then uh, in the middle, we see the capillary networks, again, typically uh, uh, shown as being purple because red and blue make purple. So it's kind of implying that we do have some sort of, of blending or mixing uh, of uh, arterial blood with venous blood. And in fact, that's sort of what's going on here. Uh, we're dropping, this is where we're able to drop off oxygen and other nutrients and then pick up uh, carbon dioxide and other waste. So at that point, we have what's called the venous circuit uh, and veins always go toward the heart. So we see all of these veins heading uh, to the right side of the heart. Okay. And then, and then we're back into the pulmonary circuit. And again, with, when we deal with pulmonary circuit, we're, we're seeing two oddball arteries and veins. And thankfully they're just named pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein. The, the pulmonary artery <clears throat> is the only artery that's going to be transporting blood low in oxygen. Okay, so pulmonary artery traveling away from the heart because our arteries always go away, uh, but this particular artery is carrying blood that's low in oxygen. Uh, the pulmonary veins then subsequently are the only veins in the body that are carrying uh, blood that's high in oxygen. So we see uh, the pulmonary vein uh, appearing as uh, red, and we see the pulmonary artery appearing as blue. And then again, we see uh, the lungs being kind of the, the drop-off point for that carbon dioxide and oxygen. <clears throat> so 
So dropping off CO2, picking up oxygen. Now, these veins and arteries are going to be slightly different in, uh, in anatomical appearance. We do see uh, arteries having to withstand more pressure uh, against their walls. So as blood is going away from the heart, the heart is pumping, blood's traveling uh, into these arteries throughout the entire body. And so every time the heart beats, we, we do see an increase in pressure against the walls of the arteries. So um, in order to accommodate for that uh, extra pressure, we do see thicker muscular walls. We, we know at this point, as we've seen throughout the semester, <clears throat> we, we look at uh, tissue, well, we look at cells and tissue kind of together, we're going to see both arteries and veins with that epithelial lining. It's going to be a very smooth epithelium. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go uh, here. There's an, another slide that kind of blows this or blows this up a little bit uh, so we can see it uh, in more detail. But we do see uh, a very smooth um, uh, epithelial lining in all of your blood vessels. Uh, we'll, we'll stick with arteries and veins for now. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then we get past that uh, epithelial lining and then we get into a, a, a small kind of connective tissue layer. So uh, for the most part, that connective tissue layer is relatively thin. It's going to be uh, a blood supply network uh, for the epithelium. It's going to be nerve supply network for the epithelium. And of course, it's the connection between that epithelium and then the smooth muscle tissue. So the, the third layer uh, working from inside the lumen uh, out, the third layer is then going to be, and again, we've seen this throughout, but we, we're really going to start seeing it uh, more and more as we travel toward the end of the semester and start looking at, at or continue looking at different types of tubing. We're going to see the, a similar theme, epithelium, generally going to be smooth. We do see with respiratory some cilia uh, along the way, <clears throat> and then a little batch of connective tissue, and then uh, smooth muscle. So we're now into the smooth muscle kind of uh, circuit, I guess, or the smooth muscle uh, uh, realm of, of uh, the muscle tissue category. Right, we looked at three muscle tissue types at the very beginning. We saw skeletal muscle. Well, we went through an entire unit on skeletal muscle. And then we saw cardiac muscle, which we looked at a little bit last week. And now we're into smooth muscle. So, and we will be for really for the rest of the semester. We do see again that that arterial smooth muscle layer is thicker because again, it does have to withstand more pressure. And then we end up with another connective tissue layer, uh, uh, kind of on the superficial aspect or, or around uh, the muscle. So it goes epithelium, connective, muscle, and then more connective. All right, so we're going to give these layers uh, a name or, or give these layers names. Uh, each layer gets a name and uh, they're going to be called tunics. Uh, a tunic uh, is kind of like a, right, like a cape, I guess, maybe like a robe or a cape. Uh, so a, a covering of some sort. So uh, the, the tunics are th triple layered. We just went through them. Uh, we're going to have the tunica intima. Uh, the intimate tunic. So the, the innermost layer uh, that's going to be, again, primarily epithelium and the epithelial and connective tissue uh, layers, okay, that first connective tissue layer. And then we have the middle, the tunica media, okay, that's going to be the muscle, there's lots of M's, the tunica media is the muscular layer in the middle, okay, so uh, more alliteration uh, in A and P. Okay, tunica externa then is going to be the, the outermost connective tissue layer uh, as well. Okay, so we've got the outermost and the innermost and then the middlemost. Okay, intima, media, externa. And again, the intima is going to be where uh, kind of that, where the blood uh, touches okay? or passes uh, by. Okay, this is what, remember too, we saw that word lumen. 
So this opening here of the tube is the lumen uh, of the blood vessel. Okay. We see elastic uh, arteries, muscular arteries, and then what we call arterioles. Um, so uh, again, el elastic arteries, uh, just like it sounds, they're going to have to have more elasticity. Uh, they're going to have to have more stretchability. Uh, but notice we do have a lot of, of smooth muscle and a lot of fibers uh, in that uh, tunica media. And then when we have a muscular artery, uh, we're going to have, we're going to be dealing with muscles. And uh, again, we see a smaller layer of muscle, but we do see a lot thicker uh, tunica externa connective tissue layer. So this is an artery that may be uh, in an appendage, uh, like a brachial artery or femoral artery. Uh, so we're going to see some of that connective tissue then attaching to uh, fascia of muscle, the uh, epimysium or the outer layer uh, of your muscles. Okay, and then we get to arterioles. These, uh, we do see the diameter start to go down a little bit. So arterioles are small arteries. So uh, as we travel, oops, so as we travel uh, from a large uh, conducting artery, and then we get a little bit smaller, head out to a muscular uh, artery, and then we start branching into even smaller areas of the body we call that an arteriole. So, so arteries generally don't dump right into a capillary network. We're gonna see arteries getting smaller and branching and tapering into, into arterioles and then capillary networks. So typically uh, an arteriole is going to terminate uh, or really doesn't terminate it just shrinks to the point that the tissue ch structure changes and we now are at a capillary bed or a capillary network um, we do see a similar uh, thing going on with veins we'll see as we leave a capillary network that blood is going to enter into what we call a venule v-e-n-u-l-e so uh, we'll see that coming up in just a few minutes. But before we do, let's stop at the capillary. So we, so we started at you know elastic arteries. Um, again, going from uh, larger diameter, smaller diameter, smallest diameter. So. Um, so that's what we're seeing till we get to, boom, now we're in a capillary network. We do see uh, a couple different types of capillaries, what we call continuous, fenestrated, uh, and sinusoid. So I'll talk about uh, what all that means in just a couple of minutes. Uh, but again, we're going to see an epithelial lining. These capillaries, uh, first of all, we're not really conducting blood or dis or these are called conducting arteries. These are called distributing arteries. So we're not really conducting uh, or distributing. Uh, at this point, we're trying to get things out of the bloodstream or into the bloodstream. So capillaries, we're not going to see that muscular layer. Okay, We're trying to get gases out of the blood. We're trying to get micronutrients uh, out of the blood. We're trying to get uh, amino acids and, and glucose, out, uh, fatty acids out of the bloodstream. So we can't have these really thick layers of, of smooth muscles. So that's maybe the first thing you'd notice when you look at a capillary versus looking uh, at uh, an artery or a vein. We, we are lacking that muscular layer. We do have the certainly the epithelial lining, the tunica intima. Uh, a continuous capillary uh, doesn't, it has a, what we call a cleft. So you can see there is in essence like a, a flap or a way to uh, potentially get things out of the, this capillary network. Um, however, that continuous idea implies that we're trying to kind of move blood through. So when we look at a capillary bed, we're going to see some capillaries that are continual, meaning where that arterial kind of tapers, we're going to have kind of the, the main trunk of the capillary network. 
So right like maybe down through the center here, you might have a, a capillary that's a continuous capillary. So we're not gonna, it's, does, it's not necessarily there for dropping off or distributing a bunch of nutrients or picking up a bunch of waste. Um, that, those continuous capillaries exist um, again, just to you know, keep the line moving with blood flow, but to also be able to kind of regulate the distribution of blood flow uh, in that particular tissue network. So um, during times of stress, the abdominal viscera doesn't need a lot of blood. So we do see the, the continuous capillaries are more active during stress when we're talking about the capillary networks in the abdomen. Whereas the skeletal muscles during stress, the capillaries there, the continuous capillaries are going to be less active and we're going to see more fenestrated capillary action where the rest of the capillaries for the most part of the capillary bed are porous. So we're going to be distributing blood out of an arterial and, and up through a network of different capillaries that are going to have tiny pores. So these, this is where we're going to get oxygen and all of these nutrients out and then uh, CO2 and waste products in. So fenestra in French means window. So these are tiny fenestras, uh, fenestrations, or tiny windows uh, in the um, uh, walls of, in the tunica interna of the capillary. All right, so sinusoid means little sinuses, so openings, cavities, so we see large gaps an incomplete basement membrane and large gaps. So we may see a sinusoid a capillary network in an area where we're just going to be dumping a whole bunch of blood uh, at once. We're less concerned about uh, regulating the levels of oxygen or nutrients traveling out or into the bloodstream. So we might see this in an area where we would have like a blood dump. And that we would think of that as maybe like the liver. So sinusoid, uh, we would see in large numbers in the liver where a lot of blood is going into the liver. The liver is kind of a hub of, of collecting nutrients for storage, collecting waste for um, kind of recycling. It's like a big recycling center. It's a, the liver is full of different functions. So um, sinusoid capillaries in the liver allow for a lot of blood to leave the capillary network. So anyway, that's, those are some examples. Oh, here's a, a thoroughfare channel. This is what I was looking for. I thought I had this slide in here. Um, but uh, anyway, we see an arterial, we see an artery and then an arterial uh, kind of branching off. And then we get another term called a meta arterial, which basically means kind of a branch, a medium uh, art artery. Okay, so we get an art. So I, uh, meta arterial is a term you may see, but I think if you, if you know, we go from arteries to arterioles to capillaries, and we ask you about a meta arterial, you're just going to fit that in the middle between arterial and capillary. So it's not meant to, to confuse or to, to be tricky. Um, so anyway, we, we do have uh, some sphincters going on here that can kind of regulate again how much blood flow we want to send up into these capillaries. And, and again, these capillaries are likely going to be more fenestrated or porous. Uh, and, you know, this in the, this thoroughfare channel um, may, may be a continuous capillary. Uh, we may even see uh, one of these uh, having less windows or fenestrations. So, but anyway, you can kind of see what's going on as we, and again, blood is moving in this direction. Okay, so this is going to be a tissue with a bunch of cells. So as we get into the capillary bed, we can drop off 
um, uh, oxygen and other nutrients into the what we call the interstitial space so all of these cells can consume what we just dropped off. And then the, the garbage gets picked up and dumped uh, back into this main channel. And then we put that blood into what we call a venule. And there's V-E-N-U-L-E. And then that venule is going to uh, end up dumping into a, a larger vein. So a vein uh, is a large venule or a venule is a small vein okay, or a branch off of a vein. There's another term that we see here that we haven't seen before, anastomosis. Uh, an anastomosis uh, is, is, in essence, like a group of, of vessels that converge or come together. It's kind of like a, uh, uh, I don't, like a, a bundle of blood vessels, an anastomosis. And we have different types of anastomoses. Uh, this uh, is a very common arteriovenous anastomosis. So the term itself, arterio, implies that uh, an artery is involved and venous implies that a, a vein is involved. So we can bypass a capillary bed entirely. Uh, and again, we would see this, especially during stress, where we're, we're really just trying to get blood, uh, oxygenated blood move through and and sent back to the to the lungs. Okay, so uh, an arteriovenous anastomosis directly links an artery and a vein. Okay, so now we end up, we made it to the vein. So we started with arteries dumped uh, into the arterioles and ultimately made it into the capillaries. Now we're dumping into the venules and, and working our way into the veins. Okay. <clears throat> we see a similar setup as we did with uh, arteries. We see the three layers, the intima, media, and externa. And again, we're not going to see as right away, you can see there isn't as much muscle involved or smooth muscle. Veins are bringing blood back to the heart. And so by the time the pressure, so, so the highest pressure is going to be at the aorta, right? As the left ventricle contracts, ejects blood into the aorta, the pressure is going to be the highest. And then we have just all these different tubes scattered throughout where the pressure just basically decreases and decreases as we distribute blood. And all of these tubes are connected. So these veins just connect back to the, you know, over to the right side of the heart from that systemic circuit. So by the time we leave the left side of the heart with that hard pump or contraction and that blood circles all the way back around to the right side of the heart, man, the, the pressure is just a lot. I mean, it's almost, almost nothing. Right? It's like probably 10 millimeters of mercury you know, from 120 down to almost nothing by the time we get into the right side of the heart. So there's not a lot of muscle involved because there's not a lot of pressure put against the walls of these veins. All right. So, um, and that's good too for when we're drawing blood or we're doing some sort of intravenous injection. We don't have to go through a lot of muscle. Muscle tissue for starters is obviously it's thicker, more dense, um, but it also has more nerve fiber. So the muscle uh, tends to be more painful and sore afterwards. So anyway, we don't usually have a lot of, of pain after we've had a blood draw. Um, so anyway, a venule. We're going to have the same epithelial lining with a little bit of a connective tissue layer. And then again, that media or muscle layer is going to be very thin. And then uh, our outer connective tissue layer called the externa, uh, again, uh, appearing to be much thicker. So if we were to look at, at the diameter, uh, the, the lumen diameter, uh, we probably wouldn't see um, a heck of a lot of difference in a, in a similar, in a, if we took a, a jugular vein and a carotid artery, the two main vessels of the neck, the diameters of those lumen are not going to be a heck of a lot different. Okay, there might be subtle 
microns in differences. The difference in the size is going to come from the thickness of, of the entire wall of the vessel. Arteries are going to have thicker walls. Okay. So that's how you can tell the difference between an artery and a vein. If we were to do a dissection, you would see uh, arteries again, very thick and their next door neighbor veins, more floppy, more thin layered. The other thing we have with veins that we see here uh, are what we call valves. And, and again, we've seen valves before. We saw them in the heart. We know that the function uh, of a valve is to prevent backflow. So same thing with veins. We don't want blood pooling. We want to get blood back to the right side of the heart. So we do see several uh, valves strategically placed throughout uh, our, our venous system, particularly within these medium sized veins. Okay, now venules don't possess uh, valves. Okay, it says many veins have valves to prevent backflow. Just again, a reminder of what's, what's going on and why we do have valves. Sometimes these valves can become weakened. Uh, they can uh, end up having scar tissue built up. We can get varicosities and, and other issues associated with valves and then thus end up with edema, patients getting swelling and, and a buildup of fluids because the valves are dysfunctional and so backflow is occurring. Yeah. Now, where do we distribute all of this? This is primarily kind of FYI, uh, but I think it's, it's kind of fascinating uh, for those of you who are into numbers uh, to see where this blood is at, at any one time. So roughly 84% uh, of your blood is in the body systems. It's in the systemic circuit, which we would expect. I mean, that's... Um, that's the, the body systems make up the majority of our bodies. So uh, a small amount, of course, is going to be in that pulmonary circuit, right? We have to send some over to the lungs and then within the heart itself. So in the heart and around the heart, we're going to find uh, a certain amount. So 7% uh, in the heart, 9% in the pulmonary circuit, roughly 15% is just in the heart and lungs. The rest of it, 85-ish percent is everywhere else. Um, and where is this blood again, uh, when we're dealing with uh, system, when we're dealing with arteries, blood is moving at a really fast pace. Uh, when, as soon as we uh, get that strong contraction of the heart and blood is zooming through uh, the arteries, it's, it's en route to capillaries and then veins and then everything kind of slows down. So we do see uh, only about 13% of, of your blood uh, of the systemic circuit, okay? 13% uh, is about 13, but these are overall now still. It's not saying 13% of 84. So now we're getting into uh, some weird numbers, but this is 13% overall. So these, these three add up to 84%. So 13% of your blood is in the arteries, systemic arteries, 64%. So almost two thirds of your blood is in your veins, systemic veins, okay? And the rest of this, again, it's this is more or less just FYI, just to show you where the majority of your blood is at this moment. Almost two thirds of your blood is in systemic venous system, sludging its way, working its way uh, through the liver and back to the heart. A uh, couple, again, more or less FYI, all of you are gonna be taking some uh, clinical courses. So uh, I've had a few students uh, voice some concern over the lack of hands-on, certainly, obviously, that we've been able to do or unable to do uh, this semester and how that may impact uh, their future uh, courses or even their future working in the, in the clinic. Uh, so you, my answer to them and response to them is, yeah, it stinks, but, um, couple of things, you know, the learning centers are open, you do still have some ability to, to get some hands on stuff. I know it's not the best. Um, 
But secondly, you are going to have ample opportunity and, and, and plenty of leeway once you start doing your uh, more kind of core nursing classes. So you're not going to be taking uh, clinical courses uh, from Zoom. You are going to be expected to be doing hands-on in our uh, on our campuses, and so you know the, those instructors know that most of you are coming in with an online type of AMP, and so there are certain things that you know they're going to be going back through with you at maybe a, a little bit slower pace just to get everybody caught up. So this is why am I bringing this up? Well, first of all, this slide is kind of a representation of that. We do this in class when we're together, we're not together. It's another one of those things. So um, that doesn't mean you're getting gypped or you're, we're, we're you know, I mean, it is what it is. What it does mean though, is that you will have uh, plenty of opportunities in your clinical courses to find these uh, uh, arterial pulse points. So anyway, uh, probably the most common is going to be the radial artery. So the radius and radial artery, by the way, this is kind of your introduction and segue into naming of vessels. And we see right away as we go down these, our, these are, again, these are pulse points. So these are going to be arteries. Arteries are where we feel pulses. Remember, that's where blood pressure is. More pressure in arteries than veins because of the heart ejecting blood into these arteries. So we see right away that, that for the most part, arteries and subsequently veins are going to be named for their region uh, of the body that they're found and, and kind of where they feed. So a temporal artery right up in the top temple region or temporal area, facial uh, artery, uh, right where that facial nerve would come, uh, come into play right to around the, the mandibular angle there. And then the common carotid artery, you guys will study, uh, there's a, a triangle in the neck, your mind's covered in hair, so I can't show you, but where the sternocleidomastoid comes in and then the trachea comes up and then the ridge or the edge of the mandible, there's a triangle right in there. And that's where you're gonna be able to palpate the carotid artery. <clears throat> this, um, this is one of the few arteries that's has an oddball name. I, they could, we do have, this is the neck area. They, uh, in the cervical region, we already have cervical artery is taken. So they couldn't use cervical artery for carotid. So anyway, we do have the common carotid. And then we have uh, the arm artery, the brachial artery, which you would, you guys will all be doing, if you don't already, we'll be learning how to do blood pressures. So that artery will come into play, certainly, uh, when we're putting our uh, uh, sphygmomanometer or blood pressure cuff on and our stethoscopes. Uh, this is the one we're listening to. Radial artery, that's going to be on, <clears throat> on the thumb side. So right, the radius. So there's a little kind of a groove or depression. Uh, we can palpate the, uh, the radius. And if you just go a little bit medial, uh, right at the wrist, there's, uh, you're going to find that radial artery. And then in the groin area, uh, we have the femoral artery. And, and that, that's about where it is. It, you could probably palpate it a little bit easier. That's a little, that's more close to maybe the inguinal artery or the groin artery. Femoral artery, you're going to maybe palpate uh, uh, down here a little bit. Uh, further, a little more distal. Uh, popliteal artery, again, named for behind the knee. And then tibial artery. Tibia is your more medial bone. So that's the a big artery uh, that's kind of nestled uh, around that medial malleolus. And then on the top of the foot, uh, the dorsalis pedis uh, artery. So Anyway, we've got artery uh, pulse points. Again, these are showing us, uh, or that's a good slide to kind of give you an idea to and an introduction to naming of arteries. Um, this is just an FYI uh, public service uh, type announcement. Uh, you've probably seen this before in uh, you know, a junior high health class uh, where you've got a normal artery and arterial wall, and then uh, we've got plaque uh, built up or uh, uh, what we call atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis. 
Um, so what we do is uh, we narrow the path of blood. So if we decrease the diameter uh, of the vessel, we're going to increase pressure uh, over in this side. So, so we see pressure, again, we see pressure higher close to the heart, right? And we naturally see vessels tapering. So pressure is higher where vessels are bigger and closer to the heart. Well, if we taper too soon by putting a bunch of plaque in there, then we see a, a buildup of pressure before we really should see uh, the pressure decreasing further down the line. So that can, can cause, uh, ex and furthermore, the, what we call the distal area, so that where the blood is ultimately traveling to, the distal aspect uh, of the blood flow, those tissues are, are not receiving blood quite in the, uh, the rate and the flow rate is going to be decreased and the heart wants to maintain flow rate. So what is the heart going to do? It's going to pump faster and harder. So we may see an increase in the number of heart beats. We may see an increase in the strength of contraction of the heart muscle. Uh, so that can lead certainly to uh, more wear and tear on the heart. And again, we see blood pressure issues because of the narrowing of that artery. Now, if this is in, if this is a coronary artery, one of the arteries that feeds the actual heart muscle, uh, and we get this plaque buildup, similar things happening, hearts pumping really hard to try and get the blood passed and out to where it needs to go. Well, depending on the amount of occlusion, the, the heart part of the heart that's receiving blood from this uh, area or this artery is going to potentially die out. If this gets completely clogged, then the tissue over here is not going to receive any blood. So we get what's called necrosis or death of tissue. So tissue necrosis occurs when we're not seeing uh, proper uh, blood flow uh, in and out. And oftentimes it's due to some sort of an obstruction. So that's what's going on uh, here. And of course, we can get you going on cholesterol medication, uh, uh, consumption awareness protocols, a diet, right? <clears throat> so um, there is a, uh, there's a, uh, a gene that um, deals with cholesterol, uh, good cholesterol kind of coming in and cleaning up the, the bad cholesterol. And so some folks in their lineage have a gene mutation that uh, has, is, decreases or has, shows it, it expresses itself as a decrease or even lack of complete lack of specific enzymes that help with keeping your arteries clean. So um, men are usually affected more by this mutation women are too. Uh, and when, when we have a heart attack victim that maybe has a fairly healthy lifestyle, nothing too red flaggy about it, uh, and they drop dead at 35 or 40 years old, um, it could be because of familial you know, heredity from genetics, a mutation regarding the enzymes. So we know this now. We didn't know this, you know, say 50, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. But as time has gone on and we were getting more young people in the coroner's office and checking their hearts and seeing, holy cow, this guy's got so like fully occluded in all of his arteries. What's going on here? And we talked to the family and the family's like, no, he, he didn't smoke. He didn't eat. He ate healthy, he, you know, exercise a little bit. He, no, uh, you know, st good stress management. It's completely out of the blue. Well, then we see, uh, oh, okay, let's check some other things. And oh, lo and behold, they're lacking a specific enzyme. And next thing you know, we start testing their offspring. So we bring all the kids in, give them the blood test and see, oh, you know, Billy's got the he's got the mutation so billy needs to keep an eye on consumption and doctor appointments and 
all of that good stuff. So genetic mapping uh, over the last 20, 25 years has really helped uh, prolong a lot of, of folks' lives. And uh, that's a good thing because nobody wants to uh, lose a loved one uh, unexpectedly anytime, let alone, uh, you know, uh, if, if we did have some uh, a medication that would mimic that enzyme and they just have to keep an eye on things. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, that's, what's going on there. Um, one other thing we see with veins, um, <clears throat> how do we get vein venous blood back up to the heart? If we're all the way down, you know, in the ankle region, um, you know, or the calf region. Well, uh, veins are oftentimes strategically placed kind of in between muscles. So for instance, when we look at uh, the calf region, we see the soleus or that flat uh, calf muscle, and then the bigger kind of flat on them, and then the bigger kind of gastrocnemius muscle. So right in between those two, we might find a, a nice size vein that uh, <clears throat> has a couple valves. And so whenever I, I produce movement with my feet uh, to do dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, I'm actually pumping. It works as like a pump. So your calf muscles, especially play the role of heart for the lower body. So they're kind of the lower body pump. Um, again, this is why sedentary lifestyle is a bad idea. Um, because, uh, you know, we, we need venous blood to get moved. Venous blood's carrying carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide and carbonic anhydrase and some of these other chemical processes we'll talk about in more detail next semester can lead to some real issues regarding uh, cellular behavior. So, and P pH balance. So we've got to get that venous blood flowing and, uh, you know, we're not asking folks to prep for the decathlon that's coming up or the 5k or any of that stuff. We just need them doing them every day, a couple times a day, a little bit of activity, a little bit of movement to get the blood flow going. Hell nowadays, you know, for, or not just nowadays for a long time now, Nowadays, you can purchase them at Walmart or Walgreens. In the past, you used to have to get a prescribed and uh, something as simple as, as what we call TheraBands or TheraTubes. These are these red, blue, and yellow uh, different uh, gauges of tubes that you can hook onto a doorknob or you can hook onto a table leg or a chair leg and you can do different types of range of motion activities. You can be sitting around watching the tube or reading a book or putting a puzzle together and you can wrap one of those babies around your ankle and wrap the other end of the doorknob and just start moving your leg and different, you know, so there's some tension that gets created. There's blood flow going on. It's, so uh, even our most sedentary patients, we, we have options. I mean, they, folks hear the word exercise or activity and their heads explode and they're ready to, to punch and fight and expend a bunch of energy <laughs> exercising to fight against exercise. So uh, anyway, we're not, like I say, we, we're not prepping them for the big, uh, the big 5k by any means, you know? So, um, this figure is in your, your open stacks. I just put it in, you need a opera glasses or binoculars to read that. Um, so it's, it's more or less just there to, to direct you if you are interested to, uh, this part of chapter 20, uh, and it's figure 20.22. We've seen these throughout the semester. In fact, you, you guys had them for a while, filling out the interactions and connections between body systems. So I think the, the connection between blood vessels uh, has been, and blood has, and the cardiovascular system as a whole, I think we've made that pretty clear uh, over the last several weeks. Um, so let's get into a couple of, of specifics. We're almost done with this chapter. Uh, the rest of this information is primarily just what are the specific names of some specific veins uh, and arteries. And um, so we've covered them before. We see, of course, the superior and inferior vena cavae coming in 
to the right atrium. And then we see the pulmonary arteries leaving the right ventricle. So get that down, uh, remember, and then, uh, then when we back go backwards and get inside the heart, you also want to remember that the, the chamber valve, chamber valve path. So right side of the heart, the vessels are superior and inferior vena cava coming in to the right atrium and then the pulmonary artery leaving the right ventricle. Now, once we're in the heart, we're at right atrium chamber, tricuspid valve uh, or um, right AV valve or atrial ventricular valve into the right ventricle and then through the pulmonary valve. So chamber valve, chamber valve, you need to remember that stuff too. Um, and then once we're out of the heart, we're over into then uh, the pulmonary uh, circuit. We've got pulmon right side pulmonary artery, uh, right side pulmonary veins, bringing it back. We've got right left side pulmonary arteries. We've got two lungs. I think that you guys know that by now. So, um, and by the way, too, as right as we pass uh, through the the uh, uh, pulmonary valve, as we leave the right ventricle, the first section uh, of of vessel is called the pulmonary trunk. So, the pulmonary trunk is, you know, it's just kind of it's like the vestibule. It's like the the entry uh, as we as we exit the heart and enter the vascular system. Uh, in that pulmonary circuit, we stop in a vestibule first, and that's the pulmonary trunk. And then we go out into those pulmonary arteries. So that's what you see kind of going on here. And then uh, when we get all the way out, uh, so this is kind of a, a teaser trailer, or a, uh, you know, a, a, a quick look at what's to come next uh, uh, next, cl next class on Thursday. We're going to Perfect, right? We're going to segue right into the respiratory system on Thursday. It seems uh, appropriate. So we, we do see what are called pulmonary capillaries then surrounding these air sacs, or they're called alveoli. So we'll look at that in more detail coming up on Thursday. This is where the gas, remember, capillaries are where we exchange items. We get stuff out of the bloodstream. We bring stuff into the bloodstream. That's capillary. Okay, pulmonary capillaries specifically for that. Um, we do have, uh, again, our artery map. We have a vein map. Uh, and, and as we go, some of the, again, the key ones we've already discussed, we've got the, the carotid arteries that, that come off of, of uh, the aorta as well as what we call uh, the brachiocephalic. So uh, as we leave the 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 heart right we and we're in the aorta the first little section right as we leave that that aortic valve right or pass through the aortic valve and leave the left ventricle we're we're going to be in a little spot right here called the ascending aorta it's very brief we're ascending aorta and then we're in the aortic arch okay and off of that aortic arch we're going to have three <clears throat> we're going to have three uh, arteries coming off of the aortic arch. So we'll look at that in more detail in a few minutes, but uh, uh, they, there's, there's an order to them that, that's alphabetical. So it's, it's going to make uh, sense to us uh, uh, as we go here in just a few more minutes. Because I think I put, uh, yep, there it is. Boop. So we'll look at that and, and kind of we'll zoom in on this spot right here in just a few minutes. Um, and then as we, and then again, the carotids in the neck going up into the head area. And then we'll see terms like subclavian. This just means under the clavicle. We'll see brachiocephalic. Brachio means arm, cephalic means head. We'll see just regular brachial. <clears throat> we'll see ulnar, we'll see radial. We'll see palmer, okay? axillary for armpit. So these are all terms you've seen before. You started studying them on day one, right? With uh, your introduction uh, to A and P. Then as we uh, descend, uh, we have what's called the descend. We have the ascending artery, then we have what's or aorta. Then we end up in what we call the descending aorta. And that descending aorta um, is going to have a couple branches coming off of it. We need to go over to the kidneys. So we're gonna see the renal 
arteries. Renal has to do with kidneys, of course. And then we're going to have uh, uh, what we a new term we'll see in a couple of weeks called mesentery. Actually, we'll see it next Tuesday. Mesentery deals with uh, your small intestines, kind of the connective uh, organ or tissue of the um, specialized tissue. So it's a new organ, mesentery. Um, let's see. And then we get into the inguinal or the groin and the femoral and popliteal and tibial. So again, I'm not going to belabor the, the, the artery stuff. I think if, if you guys, all of you in here, uh, and all of you watching at, at this point know uh, your body region terminology. So um, as we leave, so now let's zoom in to the aorta specifically in that aortic arch. We have that ascending aorta into the aortic arch, then descending aorta. And then we get into specifically, they call the abdominal aorta, which in essence is, is still part of the descending uh, aorta. So let's look at these first three branches off of the aortic arch. So the first one's going to be called the brachiocephalic. Okay? And these go alphabetically. We're going to see B, C, S. B, C, S. Sounds like college. That's like a college football thing. Bowl, college series. I don't know. B, C, S. Anyway brachiocephalic, right? Coming off the aortic arch. Brachio means head, or brachio means arm, cephalic means head. So we could assume that this first branch is probably gonna go to the arm and the head. Now, we're looking at this, this would be uh, the right side of the, of the kind of the, the group of veins. So we're working from right to left, by the way. So as we leave, you can see it better here. As we leave the, the heart and go into the aorta, we can see the first branch right over here. So this is going right side. The other two, so that's this one. Okay, so brachiocephalic. So that's gonna feed the right arm. So it's gonna go into the right brachial artery and then it's gonna feed the head. So we're gonna see the right uh, carotid artery. Okay. So brachiocephalic. So the next two, we're going to have the left common carotid artery. So there's where your C's come in. Common carotid going to the left side. We already did the right side with the brachiocephalic and then left common carotid. Okay, so we fed, um, fed the right arm and the right side of the head. Now we're feeding the left side of the head. And then we have what's called the left subclavian artery. So that's going to then go out to the left arm. Okay, so the, the, these three tubes right here, right as we leave the heart, those three tubes are going to feed the head and the arms. Okay. And then it starts descending. And travels down, uh, passes through the diaphragm. And yeah. So we'll get into that in just a couple seconds. But anyway, we've got a, a handful of arteries. Again, we have the common carotid, right common carotid artery. Common implies that there must be two or more. And the common is, is where they've come together or the, the origination. So the fact that we have the word common in this first common carotid implies that there's going to be probably branches off of that. So you're going to have what's called the internal and external carotids. So the common carotid becomes internal and external carotids. Okay. External carotid and internal carotid. Okay, notice the external carotid, it kind of disappears, feeds uh, the maxillary aspects. Okay, we've got the occipital. Okay. And then we see the cervical arteries, the vertebral arteries as well. Just going to keep her moving. Um, again, this is more or less FYI. I do want to mention that this is the base of the brain. We're looking at, at a, a worm's eye view or an inferior view. Okay, as the, the uh, internal uh, carotid has traveled and in, in internal, it's gone into the brain, uh, it's going to get to right around uh, the hypothalamus, uh, thalamus, uh, 
that optic chiasm, pituitary, right in that area. And it's going to branch into what we call the circle of Willis. So we're going to have a kind of a circle here. It looks like a person, doesn't it? It looks kind of cool. You've got uh, the legs and the arms. It looks like one of the, like a, a Southwestern uh, tribal, uh, like a Hopi Indian, you know, uh, symbol or something. But yeah, they call this the circle of Willis. And then this is what they call the bacillar uh, artery. So the internal carotid comes in and it, man, it hits the base. So the heart pumps and shoots blood, you know, right up through, and then it branches the internals branch, and then it hits the kind of the base of the brain. So this is an area for potentially a lot of, of high blood pressure. So some folks that have uh, heart issues or blood pressure issues uh, will present headaches. And so this is maybe one of the reasons. Um, one of the, the and then we start kind of distributing it uh, out to the bacillar. And, and uh, so anyway, we, we also see the vertebral arteries coming up. So we have kind of a meeting. So the bacillar, or I mean, the vertebral arteries are coming up, you've got the carotids coming up, and they all kind of converge at this bacillar artery and circle of Willis. So this spot gets a lot of blood pressure. This is why I'm talking about is this is an aneurysm location. So an aneurysm occurs when you have a weakening of an artery wall. So that's what we have going on here, a weak artery wall. Uh, potentially, because again, you've got uh, you've got the top of a, of a kind of the end of the line for the blood, and you've got all this blood coming up, boom, hitting, tush, tush. and so that has a tendency to maybe weaken uh, the vessel a little bit, and then you can develop a little kind of uh, aneurysm. So if you if that aneurysm bursts, then blood's going to travel where it's not supposed to. Okay, hey, so let's see. Do, 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 do. So we've got uh, um, a phrenic artery dealing with phrenic means diaphragm. We've got some costal, uh, intercostal arteries, um, esophageal, pericardial, basically all the organs involved. And then we travel past the diaphragm, and that's where we get into the renal areas uh, for the kidneys. And then we're going to have some. Uh, gonad arteries, and then certainly uh, sacral, inguinal, femoral, etc. Okay. So you can see it again, radial and ulnar, brachial and then axillary, and then subclavian. Again, these names should not be a, a big surprise. So veins are the same way. We, we have a couple of, of oddballs. Uh, we have the jugular veins that are bringing blood back from the head. Okay? And then we're going to have um, all the other veins for the most part. It is named for, for, the, for same as the arteries were. So we're going to have brachiocephalic veins. We're going to have intercostal veins. We're going to have uh, hepat or, uh, axillary veins, brachial veins. So one of the, the oddballs that we'll see in a few minutes is called the hepatic portal system and the hepatic vein. We're only going to look at it briefly now because when we get into digestion, we're going to see it in, in a lot more detail. But I do want to introduce you to some of the hepatic, uh, some of the intestinal and then uh, liver blood supply. All right, and then lastly, for veins, we have the longest vein in the body called Great Saphenous, S-A-P-H-E-N-O-U-S. That comes all, it starts all the way down uh, by the big toe and travels all the way up and, and kind of connects up here uh, with uh, the internal uh, iliac, I believe, I believe it is, right in there. That would be the external iliac, okay? And more specifically, I, I want to say that external iliac actually that doesn't label it, but I believe that becomes the in, is the inguinal vein right there. But I don't know; it doesn't look like they label it. So common iliac branches into internal and external iliac, and then we end up in the inguinal area, and then that's where the great saphenous. Then they have a couple femoral veins too, but my point is uh, great saphenous, longest vein in the body. 
Do, 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 do. Oh, another kind of oddball that uh, you draw blood from. So when you guys do your phlebotomy uh, stuff, you're going to see median cubital. So you want to put that in your uh, memory banks as well. Median cubital. Okay. We've got the basilic vein, the brachial vein as well in the upper arm, and then the cephalic. So that's the brachial and cephalic. Up, uh, okay, here's where I was trying to get to. The hepatic portal system. Uh, again, what we see uh, is something that, that is uh, sort of just an intro uh, to what we're gonna see in more detail uh, next Tuesday. But we, we do have all of this intestinal blood. So the intestines are absorbing all kinds of good nutrients. And um, the, first of all, the intestines are gonna be fed by arterial blood. So the venous blood that's leaving your intestines, a lot of that's gonna be carrying uh, nutrients. There might be some vitamins, minerals, there could be some waste products as well that, that make their way in. Okay. And so what we wanna do is get uh, that blood to end up going to the liver. So we see this inferior mesenteric, splenic or splenic, and it's coming from the spleen. And then we have what's called the superior mesenteric. And so we haven't really studied mesentery or mesentery. We'll see that next Tuesday. But so now that you have seen it, it does have to do with the abdominal viscera. I'll just leave it at that for now. So the abdominal viscera, venous blood is not going to dump directly into the inferior vena cava. It's actually going to dump into what we call the hepatic portal. Okay, the hepatic portal uh, is a system, it's a venous system that's bringing blood to the liver. Okay, roughly 75% of all blood going to the liver is actually venous blood. So and it's coming from the guts. Okay, and what we call the hepatic portal system, and then we'll see a hepatic portal vein. Okay. And then, so how, if the liver's not, how the liver needs oxygenated blood. So how, how do we get red blood to the liver? Well, we're going to have what's called a hepatic artery that's going to be bringing oxygenated blood to the liver. So, but that's only about uh, maybe a third or a quarter of all the blood going to the liver is actually uh, arterial oxygenated blood. The bulk is going to be from the hepatic portal system and that's venous blood. So anyway, that's your vein uh, discussion. Uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, I'm gonna pause the recording for just a minute. Okay, chapter 21 is next. It's lymphatic and immunity. And again, uh, we're really just focused on a couple of the primary organs. We'll look at a little bit of the, the micro scale and, and that'll be it. We're not going to get into uh, immunity too much at all. We'll uh, leave that for next semester. So we, when we look at the lymphatic system, we definitely put it with the cardiovascular system because it's really part and parcel. The lymphatic system is, is there to help to balance out the plasma. It helps to filter some of the plasma. It takes a little bit of the weight off of uh, the kidneys uh, when it comes to some of the intense filtration and and uh, fluid balance and maintenance that the kidneys have to do. So the lymphatic system helps to basically maintain and balance uh, fluids. So um, the fluid inside of the lymphatic system is called lymph fluid. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, lymph fluid is in essence plasma that is either going to be filtered or has already been filtered. Some of that lymph fluid will go back right into the bloodstream and become plasma again, or it's not become plasma. It's just called wherever this fluid's located, it has a different name. So if the fluid is in the bloodstream, it's called plasma. 
If it's in the lymphatic system, it's called lymph. If it's in between the two, they call it interstitial fluid or extracellular fluid, fluid that's outside of the cells. So um, there's going to be a lot of where do we get anything into or out of the bloodstream in a capillary network. So we would expect then the lymphatic system and the capillary system uh, to or the capillary aspects of the circular circulatory system to be coming together. And certainly that's what we see. That's what they've kind of blown up here for us uh, is uh, we're actually inside of a, what we call a lymph node. A lymph node is a small filtration mechanism. It's a lot like, uh, it's kind of like a mini kidney. You have about 600 lymph nodes scattered throughout the body. Uh, they're going to be located uh, primarily, they're everywhere, but we're going to see clumps or clusters of lymph nodes in the neck area, uh, the breast and armpit or axillary region, as well as the inguinal or groin area. We also see quite a bit of lymph node activity and specialized lymph action uh, in the guts or in the abdominal viscera. So you can see on this image, so we'll come back to this lymph node in a second, but you can see they're clustered quite a bit right around the hips and groin area, clustered right around the armpits and breasts, as well as the neck. Well, it just so happens that, ooh, back up, it just so happens that this lymph lymph fluid and thus the lymph nodes being more strategically located towards major uh, actions of joints uh, is, you know, uh, there's a reason for that, right? So um, again, it goes back to that sedentary lifestyle stuff, you know, uh, sedentary lifestyle is bad for fluid buildup. And, and here we see lymph nodes uh, right around our hips and, and arms and neck movement keeps lymph moving. So musculoskeletal movement is going to keep lymph uh, moving. All right. So let's zoom back over here to the lymph node. When again, we see inside uh, several capillary uh, networks, and then we've got a lymphatic capillary. So again, this is where we can get uh, fluid into the bloodstream, out of the bloodstream, into the lymphatic system, out of the lymphatic system. Then you see the, the term interstitial and then fluid. So again, that's talking about the fluid kind of in between. That's, that's the plasma that's no longer in the bloodstream. Uh, it's now en route to potentially en route to the lymphatic capillaries. We call it interstitial fluid. And then once it's in the lymphatic system, it's now called lymph. So um, nothing real complicated uh, about it. It's simply... Um, Lymph fluid and plasma and interstitial fluid are, are the three primary fluids, and, and these are the compartments. So we'll look at fluid compartments quite a bit next semester because, again, there's a big section on fluid maintenance and fluid and electrolyte balance. All right, so lymph nodes. So we had, we've had lymph, the fluid. We've had lymph nodes, the 600 little kind of mini M&M uh, filters. And then uh, we've had lymph vessels, including lymph capillaries. So those are the primary aspects of the lymphatic system. Now, there are other organs, kind of secondary lymphatic organs that we also see. One we've seen before called the thymus, the thymus gland. Um, it's going to sit right to just a little bit north or superior to the heart. You can see it kind of sitting right on top of the heart. Uh, so we'll look in a little bit more detail at the thymus gland coming up, but that's, we've seen uh, white blood cells called lymphocytes, and specifically we saw T-cell lymphocytes. So those are going to be associated with uh, immunity in the thymus gland. We also see uh, adenoids and tonsils. Uh, they don't really show them that well here, but um, all of you are familiar with tonsils, right, of, of course. So we'll look at the adenoids and, and tonsils 
uh, as well coming up. And, and we may look at those more in the, uh, we will look at more, not may, we will look at these more uh, when we get to the respiratory system because adenoids and tonsils are in an area that uh, we do see respiratory uh, and digestion kind of converging. All right, so anyway, uh, adenoids, tonsils, thymus, and then lymph nodes we've done. And then we've also got what's called the spleen. Now, I think all of you have probably heard that term at some point. That's in the left upper quadrant. And the spleen is uh, kind of like a blood reservoir. It's like a, or a lot of red blood cells and certainly white blood cells are going to kind of hang out. It's oftentimes a site where we do a little bit of um, red blood cell destruction and you know, kind of bail, helping the, the liver to, to maintain uh, red blood cell numbers. Okay, and then this we'll look at coming up too. It's a little blue blob right in this area. It's a, what they call a cistern and a cistern with an N, not a sister. Uh, cistern, C-I-S-T-E-R-N, is kind of like a, a well or like a collecting, like a tank, basically. Uh, a lot of farms have cisterns uh, where they collect water or rainwater, but this is called a cistern uh, right in this area. That's, again, kind of a collection area for lymph fluid. And then lastly, we certainly see bone marrow involved, especially with the production of some of these lymphocytes. So here's a good illustration again of, of an arterial with a, a little meta arterial coming off. And then we can see the blood capillary system uh, intertwined with the lymphatic capillary system. And then again, we're, we would certainly see flaps or some sort of openings. Uh, they call them endothelial flaps uh, within uh, the lymphatic vessel walls. So certainly the whole point is to be able to shuffle plasma and, and fluid around. So uh, we need a way to get it into the lymphatic system. So we do see these little flaps. Uh, lymph, lymph vessels also have valves because we do want to prevent backflow uh, because backflow, of course, leads to uh, edema. Edema is, is swelling or excess uh, interstitial fluid, uh, and it could be because of cardiovascular congestion. It could be because of lymphatic system congestion. Uh, but either way, uh, edema is, uh, could be kidneys are dysfunctional. So uh, there's a fluid imbalance somewhere. Um, we do have a, a couple of other items of note with these lymph vessels. All these lymph vessels are going to kind of be working, you know, some lymph fluid is going to go right back into the bloodstream, into the plasma. A lot of lymph fluid is going to continue to get pushed and pushed and pushed toward what we call a lymphatic duct. So we have two lymphatic ducts. Uh, the first one we call the right lymphatic duct. And the right lymphatic duct basically is receiving the drainage from the right arm and the right side of the head and neck. So as well as kind of the, the right torso. So in essence, the right upper body, uh, including the appendage, is all that lymph fluid is going to drain into what we call the right lymphatic duct. Now, everything else, so the left side of the head, the left side of the body, left arm, and then all of that abdominal viscera, all of the legs, that's going to dump into what we call the thoracic duct, okay? So you have two major lymphatic ducts. One is called the right lymphatic duct. The other one, unfortunately, is not called the left lymphatic duct. It's called the thoracic duct. So we have thoracic duct, right lymphatic duct. And then we can see the internal jugulars are going to receive, that's where that, the, that cleansed lymph fluid is going to end up back into uh, the bloodstream, into the venous supply, and ultimately into that superior vena cava. All right, we see this uh, cistern that I mentioned earlier, right in kind of the center, uh, just a little bit superior to the umbilical area. The umbilicus is probably closer to uh, being down in, in this region. So kind of below the diaphragm or inferior to the diaphragm and, and superior to the umbilicus, we're gonna find the cisterna chile uh, of the thoracic duct. So that cistern is a collection area of a lot of the stuff coming from the lower body 
and then uh, it's going to go into that cistern and then we're going to get it drained into the thoracic duct. Okay, so two major ducts. Right lymphatic duct just drains the right upper uh, body and then the uh, thoracic duct gets everything else. All right, well, we've seen this image or this illustration, so I'm not gonna uh, belabor that one, but you wanna uh, recall that we do have specialized uh, lymphoid stem cells, right? Everything came from uh, the bone marrow. We saw myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells. So all blood cells are gonna uh, come off of the myeloid stem cells, um, except for uh, the lymphocytes. We see the T cells and the B cells, and those are coming off of what we call lymphoid stem cells. And this is a, a picture of some bone marrow. You can see it's red primarily, and there's a little bit of yellow marrow uh, in there as well. Okay, so again, just a couple of more slides and then we'll, we'll call it a day. We uh, will hone in on, on the thymus gland here a little bit. Uh, again, we're gonna see uh, several things going on. We're gonna see ducts uh, dumping in uh, and collecting uh, a lot of this, uh, the cells, the lymphocytes that are coming from bone marrow. So the thymus gland is kind of like a, um, a college or a, a boot camp, if you will, uh, for uh, B cell lymphocytes to become more mature. So the thymus is a maturation uh, site for, uh, for lymphocytes. And it has uh, a capsule around it, uh, just like most, most of our solid organs and solid glands will have some sort of a outer uh, capsule. And then again, we see what's called the cortex, which is going to be the outermost, uh, besides the shell, but uh, the, the most superficial aspect of the, of the uh, meat of the organ, we call the cortex. We're going to see this again when we look at the pancreas, when we look at the adrenal gland when we look at the kidneys, we're going to see the cortex being that outermost region. And then the medullary aspect is the inner uh, region. Okay. We kind of saw this with the adrenal glands when we did endocrine system a couple of weeks back. We saw the uh, cortico, uh, mineral corticoids and some of your other cortico hormones. And then we saw uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine coming from the medullary aspects of the adrenal. We see the same kind of setup with uh, the thymus. We have the cortex and cortical tissue, uh, specialized cells, and then we have the medullary aspect. And again, that's where we're going to see a lot of the macrophage, uh, big eaters, a lot of your um, white blood cells or other leukocytes kind of hanging out uh, down there. The cortex is going to be more uh, immature thymocytes or, or T cells. Yeah, we'll see all kinds of stuff with the thymus uh, next semester regarding immunity. We'll look at natural killer cells. We'll look at helper T cells and what they call cytotoxic T cells. So we're going to see some very specialized uh, uh, lymphocytes and other T cells coming out of the thymus. One other thing with the thymus before we move into a lymph node, the thymus gland does deteriorate faster with age than probably any other organ. Okay, so uh, the thymus is kind of at its peak when we're, you know, kind of children, adolescents, teenage years. That's when the thymus really is peaking out. And then uh, by the time we're in our 20s, it's kind of hit that peak and is now on the downswing. And heck, by the time you're in your 70s, 80s, the thymus gland is practically uh, gone. It's practically deteriorated. And that's why elderly folks are one of the reasons, there's a million, but there's one, another one, why elderly folks ha have more of a uh, compromised immune system because their thymus gland is uh, shriveled up and probably not doing anything. So they have to be more careful with uh, uh, getting colds and stuff like that. That's why COVID, for instance, any respiratory disease is uh, more harmful for elderly because their T cells are um, 
not as prevalent because of the absence of a thymus gland. All right, we look at a lymph node, we see the same thing kind of going on. We've got the cortex on the outside and the medulla on the inside. We see little uh, trabeculae, just like we saw with bone, these little kind of uh, stacked, uh, organized kind of, uh, of uh, canals and tunnels. That was our spongy bone, right? Trabecular bone, spongy bone. Yeah. So there's, a, there's some spongy, uh, there's a spongy nature to lymph nodes. They're, they're usually fairly, um, they're fairly hard. So they're, they're kind of almost like a jelly bean. You can, you can squeeze them and with a little more pressure, you can, you can squeeze them even, you know, but mm -hmm. usually they, they are fairly solid. A um, couple of things too, like some of your patients may come in and they may have uh, some sort of a, they've got a bump. Right? A bump. That could be anything. So um, generally, it, it could be what we call a, a lipoma. And a lipoma is basically like a fatty tumor. Uh, some of that subcutaneous fat gets encapsulated and you kind of develop like a little excess uh, fatty ball. So those are very common and they're completely benign, they're harmless, and unless they're in a location that, uh, like in the armpit or the neck or something where there's a lot of friction, then we usually just leave a lipoma alone. Then we have a, they call it a sebaceous cyst, where a sebaceous gland, and we've, we've talked about sebaceous glands, we maybe even talked about lipomas. And then, um, so those are usually a sebaceous uh, uh, well, a lipoma and a sebaceous cyst can, are a little maybe more um, pliable than a lymph node. Like a swollen lymph node is going to be a lot harder maybe than like a sebaceous cyst or a um, some sort of a lipoma. So um, a, a lipoma and a sebaceous cyst usually we kind of leave them alone and they either don't get any bigger and they may even go away. Uh, or, you know, like I say, they generally don't cause issues. Uh, a swollen lymph node uh, could be a sign of an infection. So if you do have a cold or an illness of some sort, naturally your lymph nodes might be a little swollen. Now, if uh, the, the, cold persists and the lymph nodes being swollen persists and they're hardened and they're, they're, they're inflamed and they don't really, that doesn't go away. That's a problem. So we definitely want to keep uh, that uh, in the notes. All right. Spleen, uh, spleen's kind of nestled right next door to the stomach in that left upper quadrant. Um, again, we're going to see uh with the little trabeculae and uh, the, the kind of a capsule. What we see with the spleen is something called red pulp and white pulp. So we've got uh, red pulp implying that there's probably a lot of red blood cell activity. So um, generally uh, that's where we're gonna see red blood cell storage. White pulp uh, gets into uh, antigen activity, gets into some of the white blood cell uh, activity and, and some of the lymphatic aspects of what's going on. Uh, monocytes, uh, one of our um, agranulocytes, one of our white blood cells, monocytes uh, generally uh, increase in high numbers in the spleen during uh, uh, some sort of, an, of a viral, or usually it's like a viral infection, could be bacterial. But if monocytes are, are busy, they do a lot of phagocytosis, a lot of cleaning up of debris. Um, there's something called mononucleosis that uh, can cause the uh, spleen to become enlarged and that can persist for, for many weeks, even after the person is clear of the mono, uh, they could still have a swollen uh, spleen. So we want to, or an enlarged spleen. So we want to be careful with physical activity uh, with someone who's had mono. Um, tonsils, we look at what are called the pharyngeal tonsils uh, and the palatine tonsils. The pharyngeal tonsils uh, are going to be kind of just like they sound. They're going to be part of, of uh, the pharyngeal region, which is the back of the throat area. 
call that the oops we call that the oral uh, pharynx uh, specifically there uh, the um, pharyngeal tonsils kind of uh, disappear a little bit they're kind of, of hard to see um, you can see the what we call the uvula let me see if I can find this little there's like a little dangly object in the back of the throat the uvula, if you go past that and kind of up above it and in, almost into the nasal cavity, that's where you're going to find the pharyngeal tonsils. So they're kind of hard to access. Okay. The two big ones that you see are called palatine tonsils. Okay. Those two big, big round ones uh, that you see in the mirror. Those oftentimes get uh, will get removed, right? If you have a tonsillectomy, it's usually the palatine tonsils. Okay. The pharyngeals, they call the adenoids too, adenoids. So sometimes they'll remove the adenoids as well. Um, I think that's it. I don't have much else um, with uh, the immune system. Uh, mucus associated lymphoid tissue nodule. So again, so it's some of the mucus, not only that we produce in the respiratory system, but the digestive system, especially we're going to find little pyres patches are called little bundles or groups of cells that are mucus producing. So that's so we'll end on that. We'll end on mucus uh, production. So um, that's it for today. I, I uh, again want to uh, encourage you guys to get on the padlets uh, and start working on your assignment if you haven't already uh, for unit eight. That really pretty much concludes uh, what we're going to be discussing in unit eight. Some of, we started with some of the basics of, of blood. What are the components of blood? We looked at uh, blood clotting, what we called hemostasis and coagulation a little bit. Um, we looked at certainly going back, we looked at the plasma and the components of plasma, the cellular aspects and what those components are, a little bit of functions of each one. Uh, we got into blood typing a little bit. So um, that was chapter 18. And then 19, we discussed the, some of the basics of heart structures. And then we moved into uh, talking about blood vessels and just some of the, again, the basics of blood vessels. And then uh, going through the lymphatic system again, you were just thinking about the lymph nodes, lymph as the, the fluid and lymph vessels, and then these associated kind of structures with uh, the lymphatic system, uh, the tonsils, for instance, and uh, the spleen, the thymus gland, okay. That cistern. Other than that, um, we pretty much tied up unit eight. Okay, so um, I will be putting the exams. You'll have a you'll have two exams again. You'll have one that covers blood and heart. You have another one that covers um, blood vessels and lymphatic system. Those are, again, the pools will be relatively small. You'll be able to uh, uh, review through those and, and you shouldn't have any trouble uh, with, with any of that. So um, I guess that's it. On Thursday, we'll start unit nine. We'll, we'll get into the respiratory system. And then uh, next Tuesday, we'll do digestive and just keep her moving. So you guys have a great weekend. Yep, see you guys next time. Thanks for coming in today.